My name is Gyota Jonan, and I'm the director of the World Movement for Democracy. The World Movement for Democracy is a network of democracy activists, human rights defenders, practitioners like members of parliament to come together to advance democracy. We empower civil society actors by connecting with each other, um, sharing knowledges and knowledge and best practices and inspiring each other. The world movement has been concerned about shrinking civic space for almost 15 years. Um, in 2004, 2005, we saw the first wave of restrictive legal measures being introduced against civil society, particularly in Eurasia region. As people in countries like Ukraine, Georgia, and others powerfully demanded democratic futures of their own society. Since then, we've been partnering uh, with the groups like the International Center for No for Profit Law, ICNL, Article 19, and the Civicus to protect and enhance civic space by engaging with the international community, helping strengthen international norms and connecting local partners with expertise. Unfortunately, as you know, the civic space remains under attack. Many governments and authorities are more assertive today in use of access, excessive power, uh, excessive forces, legal framework, and public denunciation against civil society actors, citizens, and political opponents. Against this discouraging background, um, civil society around the world have shown its resilience. Uh, in many corners of the world, civil society is pushing back those threats, mobilizing themselves, building alliances in both civil society and political society, utilizing their constitutional tools and exploiting political opportunities. Civil society actors in Ethiopia, Guatemala, and Nigeria have succeeded in somewhat securing their civic space. Today's discussion, uh, you will hear from those experiences, and hopefully we can celebrate their successes all together. While we recognize that these victories may be relatively limited, they are very important building blocks for civil society's sustained efforts to reclaim civic space. As you learn from following presentations today, their successes are not the result of quick interventions. They were built on years of efforts in cultivating relationships with others institutionalizing engagement mechanisms and strengthening their argument for expanded civil society. The COVID crisis has exacerbated challenges to democracy and the civic space, as you all know. We hope today's discussion will provide us not only with hope, but also practical tools to overcome threats against our civic space. Now, let me hand the microphone over to my colleague, Troy Johnson, Senior Manager for the World Movement, who has been leading our efforts on civic space. Thank you for joining today. Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us. Uh, thank you, Ryota. It's uh, my distinct privilege today to introduce today's speakers, um, most of whom I, I worked with to develop these three case studies. Uh, so I've greatly appreciated their, their partnership and their patience with me over the past several months. The case studies which are available on our website, and uh, Kayla, if you could please share the, the links in the chat, that would be great. Also include dozens of tools and resources that civil society created to achieve these successes that we hope we will all be able to, to utilize and, and, and learn from. Uh, but without uh, further ado, I'd like to introduce our, our speakers. Uh, the first is uh, uh, the first individual I'll introduce is Eddie, Kru uh, Eddie Kush, the director of Transparency International in Guatemala. We also have Ricardo Barrientos, the senior economist uh, for the Central American Institute of Fiscal Studies, also known as ISEFI. Uh, not on the call yet, but hopefully joining us shortly will be uh, the Bibi Hegabel of the Bibi Hegabel Law Offices in Ethiopia who's been one of our long, uh, long-standing partners. And then we're also very pleased uh, to have Clement Foulet with us today, who is the UN Special Rapporteur on the Rights to Freedom of Peaceful Assembly and Association. 
unfortunately, the individual who helped us out with the research on the Nigeria paper, uh, uh, Adiyat Hassan, the director of the Center for Democracy and De Development is unable to be with us today. She took ill uh, earlier this morning. And so we wish her a speedy recovery, but we're really pleased that we could, um, we could get uh, Ibrahim Farouk uh, on the call with us who has knowledge of the successes in Nigeria. And so he'll be speaking on her stead. Um, uh, Ibrahim is a program manager for the Youth Initiative for Advocacy, Growth and Advancement, um, which is also known as Yaga in Nigeria, which has been one of our really longstanding um, partners at the World Movement. So thank you for joining us on short notice. Uh, before we get going, though, I would like to say a couple things about the Nigeria paper specifically. Um, when we began looking at that paper, we were really looking at um, a piece of legislation known as the NGO bill, or the bill uh, for an act to establish the Civil Society Regulatory Commission for Connected Purposes. Uh, and when we began speaking with our partners, Adiat and others, uh, including individuals at Yaga, they really mentioned that we need to look at three bills together. Um, the other two bills, uh, the hate, spe hate, hate speech bill and the social media bill, as they're known in shorthand, were all being considered at the same time. And an important uh, outcome of the case study that we created was that these three bills coming together at the same time really uh, forced civil society to develop partnerships with the media in particular and the creative sector in particular. And so some broader coalitions that were already there um, uh, nascent uh, really came together to push back against this series of bills which um, uh, helped to um, uh, push back on restrictions that would have uh, affected both uh, freedom of expression rights in addition to freedom of association rights which we were primarily interested in looking at with these papers. Um, so that's uh, just an introduction to that Nigeria paper, but I'll let Ibrahim talk more about the context there. And so I'd like to start out with um, Guatemala. Ricardo, if you could please give us some, some background into the country's success in, in Guatemala, what was happening, what was the threat, and what were the major uh, elements of, of civil society's efforts in achieving the success that they achieved there. So to Ricardo. Bueno, um, ocurre que eh, desde dos administraciones de gobierno anteriores a las actuales, eh, se ha venido registrando en Guatemala el impulso de una agenda, eh, tanto legislativa como política, para tratar de criminalizar eh, la protesta legítima, la organización ciudadana legítima y eh, las actividades de, or de organizaciones no gubernamentales independientes. También se ha impulsado una agenda legislativa regresiva que busca restringir eh, derechos fundamentales en Guatemala. Eh, entre estos derechos está el de la libertad de expresión, ataques a la prensa, pero también eh, desde 2017 incluso se presentó una propuesta legislativa para <coughs> supuestamente regular y controlar la formación y el funcionamiento de organizaciones no gubernamentales independientes. Eh, en febrero de 2020, eh, este, eh, esta propuesta fue aprobada por el Congreso de la República y eh, sancionada para su vigencia por el presidente de la República. El presidente actual, Alejandro Giamatei Falla, fue electo el año pasado, en 2019, y asumió el poder en enero de 2020. Durante este año, él ha demostrado eh, que su gobierno tiene una actitud eh, agresiva en contra eh, de, la de la sociedad civil organizada, en contra de la prensa y entonces eh, ya en febrero, con solo un mes en, en el poder, eh, con la sanción para vigencia de esta ley que coloquialmente se, se conoció ya como ley anti-ONG, eh, demostraba claramente su posicionamiento. Eh, debo decir que, eh, y más adelante vamos a hablar sobre el ex
eh, y la sociedad guatemalteca que tener y ojalá eh, definitivamente la vigencia de esta ley. Eh, actualmente eh, Guatemala está en una crisis política muy grave en la cual se han eh, 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 protagonizado manifestaciones pacíficas manifestaciones ciudadanas ejerciendo el libre derecho a la organización y a la, a, a la protesta ciudadana del gobierno el sábado 21 eh, eh, las reprimió violentamente eh, se habla que eh, eh, el gobierno o alguna organización eh, antidemocrática está infiltrando agitadores dentro eh, de las manifestaciones. Así es que lo que se hizo con la ley, lo que se logró con la ley de ONGs, eh, no solo tenemos que verla hacia atrás como un éxito ya logrado, sino que tiene una vigencia viva y muy actual, porque eh, los intentos de criminalizar la organización ciudadana continúan y permanecen en Guatemala. Entonces, ese sería mi comentario de contexto, que es un contexto muy actual también. Okay, great. Uh, thank you for that introduction, uh, Ricardo. And I see also Debebe, who I've already introduced, is on the line. Um, so Debebe, I'll, I'll give you a second before I come, come to you uh, so you can uh, settle in a little bit. So with that, um, uh, Ibrahim uh, Farouk from, from Nigeria, uh, I sort of mentioned a little bit about what is in our paper. So if you could kind of expound on that, discuss what the threats were, and what civil society is able, was able to do to push back on these bills. Um, you have a five minutes uh, to give us a sense of that. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Troy, and for the opportunity to speak um, on what has been happening around protecting civic space in Nigeria. I, I think the attempts to stifle um, or to close civic space in Nigeria has been ongoing for quite a while. And there have been various attempts um, in terms of legislation um, to, close civ to close civic space um, by one means or another. Um, so this is definitely not the first time um, where civil society has had to come together to work um, towards ensuring um, civic space is protected. But earlier this year, um, especially before many of the COVID-19 lockdowns, um, a few pieces of legislation were introduced um, in the Nigerian National Assembly, where we have the Senate and the House of Representatives. And you mentioned some of these legislation. Um, one was the Protection Against Internet Falsehood, which was popularly called the Social Media Bill. And there's also the one um, prohibition of hate speech, um, which is called the Hate Speech Bill, and the NGO Bill, which seeks to establish a regulatory commission um, for civil society. But what, what, one thing that, that has worked for us, um, especially, is seeing how civil society organizations have come together. Because um, wh whatever is an at attack or a threat on civic space um, affects all of us. And so this includes not just um, civil society organizations, um, but also religious organizations, trade institutions, um, entertainment, the entertainment industry as well, um, and, and even the media as well. Um, because largely due to the vague um, wordings in many of these pieces of legislation. Um, it, it, it leaves so much room for interpretation um, in, in such a way that it can, it can be taken advantage of and certain fundamental and constitutional rights and freedoms, um, which are already enshrined in our constitution can be trampled on at will. I remember that um, one of the things civil society organizations did um, was to present memoranda and, and papers to the Senate um, to the Senate Committee on Justice, um, which held a public hearing. And I remember in the memo that Yaga Africa, um, where I work, sent, um, it, it said that it is not reasonably justifiable in a democratic society to pass a piece of legislation that stifles the freedom of expression, um, especially as it is contained in the social media bill. Other provisions of the bill also have concerns around data privacy and how government institutions are able to mine um, the data of citizens in order to determine whether um, they can clamp down. And, and, and in some instances, also giving the government power to shut down 
um, the internet as well. On the on the hate speech bill as well, um, there, there are also provisions um, with, with with some with some penalties as steep as the death penalty um, as well in the hate speech bill. But how, however, we already had a cyber crimes act um, as well, which which already covers for a lot of what was in the hate speech bill and in the social media bill. Same thing with the NGO regulatory commission bill, because um, we already have frameworks um, such as the corporate affairs commission and the corporate uh, company and allied matters act um, another piece of legislation which all already provide um, legislation to for a framework um, for which civil society can can operate within but what has been successful for us is how we've been able to build bridges and build linkages across um, civil society and like i said earlier for us civil society took a broader definition to look at religious institutions and having religious leaders speak about the implications of some of this legislation, um, getting our colleagues in the media as well to amplify the voices and amplify the concerns that um, civil society raised. And, and very interestingly, because social media is a tool that is used largely by young people um, as well, we were able to get um, the entertainment industry and musicians as well to come together. Just recently, um, earlier this month, um, the civil society organizations that presented memoranda at the um, Senate hearing came together again to say, look, um, you still haven't published the report um, from the hearing and, and whether the memoranda that were submitted um, were in favor or, or against um, the social media bill. So by, by no means um, have we won this battle, but we have shown that um, in previous times that we can, we can be successful when we work together, when we unite um, around voice, with, around one voice, around one message, around one issue, um, regardless of where we work, um, all these legislation would affect us in one way um, or another. Um, as I wrap, as I as I wrap up, um, I think also just to add that we do not also think that this is the last. This is going to be the last attempt um, to stifle voices or to to close the civic space, but we're going to continue to learn the lessons um, from previous examples and the successes that we have had and continue to build on them as we continue to work to ensure that the civic space is open and citizens' voices can be heard. All right, excellent, uh, Ibrahim, thank you for that. Uh, contribution. Um, now, Debebe, we are glad that you were able to make it into the meeting uh, finally because Ethiopia is a really interesting and, and unique example for us and I think many people who are uh, viewing this discussion will be somewhat familiar with um, the situation there. So uh, if you could uh, speak about that, that would be excellent. Yeah, uh, thank you so much. Uh, and uh, I'm so sorry for being late uh, because of some uh, technical issues. Uh, otherwise, uh, I would like to thank uh, the organizers uh, for having me and giving me this opportunity. So uh, I'll look uh, first into the, um, the country context, um, the governance uh, context. Uh, I don't know, maybe you can share them uh, uh, my presentation. Uh, when it comes to the development of uh, civil society organizations in Ethiopia, uh, maybe it's good, you know, uh, to look into uh, uh, the different periods uh, because, you know, uh, it has its own unique feature uh, when you look at it from uh, different um, uh, political systems and also uh, different uh, periods. So I divided, uh, you know, uh, the development sector uh, into four or five periods. One is pre-1974. Uh, that is during uh, the imperial regime. Uh, and it was for uh, the first time that, you know, the sector has got um, a legal recognition by uh, the 1960 Civil Court of Ethiopia. Uh, this court uh, provided recognition for the sector uh, that uh, individuals have the right to establish association. And, uh, you know, uh, for the, uh, uh, the court um, provided a wider uh, freedom in terms of purpose uh, for which uh, civil society organization can be established. There is no um, any kind of um, restriction in terms of purpose, and as long as it's lawful, uh, that was uh, something positive. But uh, that court uh, was not as such um, uh, a full uh, pledge uh, court in terms of governing uh, 
civil society organizations uh, from a freedom of uh, association perspective and also uh, in terms of uh, modern uh, CSO. So although it has its own limitation, but at least, uh, you know, uh, for the formal CSO, that was uh, the turning point uh, where um, uh, the Zen uh, uh, Emperor uh, issued uh, this uh, civil code uh, and devoted a certain provision uh, that can govern uh, CSO. So the second period may be from the 1974 to 1991, where Ethiopia, uh, you know, engaged into a different political system, uh, socialism. Uh, during this period, uh, I can say that uh, there was no any independent CSOs, um, rather CSOs were, uh, you know, sponsored by government and established by government, and it was like um, all um, uh, all for um, mass based organizations uh, sponsored by uh, by the government, uh, and that is mainly because of the ideology of the then uh, government, uh, but. Uh, after uh, the advent of EPRDF into power in 1991, uh, this, this is also another period from 1991 to 2005, where we have a um, number of uh, civil society organizations uh, in terms of uh, not only number, but also in terms of diversity and also in terms of coverage. And it was maybe for the first time that CSOs become, you know, active in the areas of um, human rights uh, and also good governance. So, uh, many uh, agree that uh, this period was uh, maybe uh, the golden period um, uh, at that time uh, because somehow uh, the number of CSOs proliferated uh, and this is because of the political change, not only CSOs but also even media uh, outlets. But after 2005, uh, because of the national, the outcome of the national election, again, you know, uh, the relationship between CSOs and the government become uh, very, very um, strained. Uh, and as a result, uh, the government, you know, came up with um, a draconian legislation, as I was uh, in 2009, uh, as a result of, you know, uh, um, restricting the space, not only for the CSOs, but to the whole uh, democratic institutions, including the press and also a political party. So, in 2009, the government adopted um, the proclamation number 621, uh, 2009, uh, which is by and large, uh, very restrictive uh, by any standard. Uh, uh, therefore, uh, because of uh, this legislation, a number of CSOs have been you know, uh, closed, particularly those working in the areas of uh, human rights, governance, peace and conflict, and access to uh, justice, uh, and on average, uh, each year um, uh, there were like uh, more than 100 CSOs um, being closed. Uh, therefore, the impact was um, the far reaching. Uh, that legislation put restriction on access to resource and also put restrictions on uh, freedom of uh, operation and also access to justice. Therefore, the, uh, the CSOs have engaged um, in advocacy uh, activities uh, to change uh, this legislation. Uh, although uh, it took us a long uh, period of time, maybe uh, almost uh, for 10 years, CSOs have been engaged uh, in terms of uh, changing these legislations using uh, different kinds of uh, advocacy approach, uh, such as research uh, and also uh, engaging the government uh, through uh, various mechanisms. So, uh, in short, uh, until uh, you know uh, 2018, which I'll come and discuss later on, uh, uh, from 2009 up to 2019, the space was uh, very much restrictive, and uh, we had a very good um, uh, example of the worst um, legislation maybe uh, uh, in the world. Uh, I, uh, I didn't see any kind of, uh, I mean, such kind of legislation in any other country. So that legislation was um, really uh, very, very draconian and uh, restrictive, affecting uh, the capacity of CSOs and also affecting the whole democratization process in the country. Uh, thank you so much. Okay, thank you for that introduction, um, Debebe. Now, uh, if I could, uh, I would like to turn back to uh, Ibrahim. Is Ibrahim still on the call? Oh, there, yeah, Ibrahim's still on the call. So 
Ibrahim, I'd like to hear a little bit more about what you mentioned, the, the partnerships that sort of expanded uh, with civil society, but then with lawmakers and with other sectors. Uh, what we found when we put the case study together was that uh, uh, there was just a lot of material that was being produced to push back against these laws, whether it was infographics or um, cartoons and, and parody in the media videos, there were um, events where celebrities were speaking out against these bills, etc. So if you could speak a little bit more about that and, and how the success was, a, how, how really popular opinion was, was swayed um, through these types of activities, that would be great. Um, th thank you very much, Troy. And I, I think from experience with us um, here in Nigeria and working with the National Assembly, it, it, it takes um, a lot of work um, to actually sweep public opinion. And in order to, to get citizens involved and understand the implication of legislation as it affects them, um, maybe due to the challenges of getting information, um, especially from the National Assembly, and even though it is supposed to be the most representative institution in our democracy, um, it, it is one of the most closed institutions when it comes to access inf accessing information and getting the information out there. Um, but thankfully, um, with having so many civil society organizations that already work in the National Assembly and engage with the legislative process, we were able to very early on um, have access to some of these pieces of legislation and analyze them and see what were the implications if they passed. Uh, now, one thing that our that our lawmakers and our politicians understand um, is that language of public opinion and mass mobilization and mass support, because um, politicians think in in electoral cycles and in terms of votes. And as long as you can get a, a mass movement of citizens um, talking about a certain issue or a certain piece of legislation, um, our lawmakers are definitely going to take notice, um, sit up, and definitely take action. Um, but what we're able to do, and, and Troy, you mentioned um, some of it, was to ensure that at events, for instance, where musicians or, or film actors or anyone in the entertainment industry, so to speak, that had a platform, we had held meetings and we had engaged with them and were able to share some of our concerns and our recommendations in a way that it was very easy for anyone to understand and for them to also use their platforms um, to also pass it pass the same message across another thing that we did um, especially towards reaching young people um, was was creating short videos that could be very easily shared on social media either on facebook or on twitter or on instagram or on whatsapp um, in such a, a way that it would it would generate a conversation and get get people to ask questions that what is this about? And, and taking the so-called complex complexities of, of legislation and just breaking it down and making it very easy and very fun um, for anyone to understand. We, we also targeted a lot of like radio morning shows or prime time on television and on radio in such a way that you, you're, you're, you're driving to work and you hear the conversation about this piece of legislation and you come home in the evening and you turn on the evening news and, and, and you hear that same conversation and it, it sticks in your head. Um, you, you pick up a newspaper and you're flipping through pages and just reading an opinion piece um, about it as well. Um, but it took a lot of, of strategy and working behind the scenes. And I think I must also add that there were, there were some lawmakers who do not support um, this legislation as well. So it, it was also very helpful to have a voice or a dissenting voice in the National Assembly as well, um, saying, look, the, the, these bills are not reasonably justifiable in a democratic society and, and they must not pass. Finally, um, was to get the contacts of, of lawmakers and, and share them and say, look, um, this is your representative. Um, call your representative, send him or her a message, um, send him or her a letter, let them know that you are their constituent and this is your stand, this is your position on this certain legislation. And, and when it comes up for debate um, on the floor of the House or on the floor of the Senate, um, as my representative, this is my position. And since you're representing me um, in the National Assembly, this is the position that we want you to take. 
Okay, that's that's excellent. And Ibrahim, if in the links in the case study, we missed any interesting short videos, some of these resources that you're familiar with, uh, if you could uh, give them, give us an email, we can post that to the case study as well. That would be excellent. We're, we're always happy to have creative examples of advocacy. Now, I wanna turn back to the Guatemala situation and, and Eddie uh, Kush, if, if you could, um, a little bit more specific question. In, in Guatemala, the legislative advocacy was very important and uh, including the writ of Amparo, which is used throughout Latin America and amicus curiae. Uh, um, so if you could speak a little bit about that and how civil society coordinated itself and where you found allies within the government counterparts, but also a bit from the international community, which the paper focuses on to some extent, um, that would be great. Thank you. Gracias, Troy. Uh, Yo creo que, eh, al igual que en, en otras partes del mundo, como se ejemplifica, existe una tendencia mundial eh, en algunos países de reducir esos espacios y esas libertades eh, democráticas, la libertad de asociación y la libertad eh, de manifestación y de expresión. En el caso de Guatemala, eh, al momento que nosotros nos enteramos de una reforma a la ley de ONGs, eh, nos dimos cuenta que realmente existía una amenaza directa hacia, hacia las asociaciones. Y entonces, eh, como existía una amenaza, ¿de qué se trataba? Y, digamos, y, y, y yo quiero enfocarme un poquito en esa parte jurídica que ya después llegaremos a explicar un poco del de tema de qué estrategia fue la que se siguió, pero en resumen, las libertades que se restringían se hacían por parte del gobierno en, por ejemplo, en amplios poderes que tenía el gobierno o que querían en la reforma controlar a las organizaciones, eh, pues al cerrarlas, al considerarlas una amenaza, pero no se definía, por ejemplo, qué tipo de amenaza podía ser una organización o una asociación. También eh, se definían algunos controles administrativos de operación, de supervisión, incluso sobre las donaciones que puedan recibir las, las organizaciones. Y entonces, este tipo de amenaza, lo que hacía era que querían control, o lo que pretendían era controlar realmente a las organizaciones. Eh, pero entonces, Frente a esa reforma que realmente afecta y que fue aprobada por el presidente actual, eh, eh, Alejandro Yamatei, eh, ¿cuál fue la reacción de las organizaciones? Y ahí es donde es importante relatar cómo es que eh, ya desde hace bastantes años se ha promovido una transparencia legislativa por parte de la sociedad civil. Eh, desde el 2008 existe una ley de acceso a información pública en, acá en Guatemala que hace obligatorio al Congreso que publiquen eh, las iniciativas de ley, que publiquen las discusiones que se generan. Entonces, varias organizaciones mantienen un monitoreo legislativo. Es decir, están viendo eh, qué tipo de leyes están promoviendo en el Congreso. Y vale la pena decir este trabajo porque en los últimos años el Congreso de la República ha promovido varias leyes regresivas, tanto como la ley de ONGs, como algunas eh, leyes vinculadas a la impunidad. Y en Centroamérica, especialmente en Guatemala, hay mucho tema, eh, o está mucho, o es, muy, eh, es, es muy conocido de los actos de corrupción, el funcionamiento de una Comisión Internacional contra la Impunidad en Guatemala, o, en la, o de la comisión también de la OEA en, en, en Honduras, y entonces mucha de la sociedad civil ha, se ha enfocado en denunciar la corrupción, y por eso mismo es que eh, el Congreso y el gobierno quisieran limitar la actividad de denuncia que hacen las organizaciones y también y la prensa o, 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 o los medios de comunicación. Y entonces, eh, cuando existía una o cuando existió una eh, intención de reformar la ley de ONGs, lo que se hizo, lo que se ha hecho durante bastante tiempo es monitorear la actividad legislativa. Cuando, se, cuando empezó el Congreso a aprobar las reformas, automáticamente la, la sociedad civil 
especialmente nosotros en Acción Ciudadana de Transparencia Internacional, empezamos a hacer un análisis jurídico de qué tipo de restricciones de libertades eh, existían dentro de la ley. Eh, empezamos a definir qué tipo de acciones legales, y acá viene el, el, el tema de presentar un, una acción constitucional de amparo, que es una acción de protección de derechos fundamentales, eh, que se eh, conceptualiza acá en Guatemala, y que ayuda a que cuando una persona o una organización está siendo amenazada de su en sus derechos fundamentales, uno acude al, a las cortes de justicia a que le protejan a uno de esos derechos fundamentales. Y en este caso, la ley de ONGs lo que eh, pretendía era limitar el derecho de asociación y el derecho de, eh, de expresión y el funcionamiento, y por eso mismo es que se presentó una acción legal. Y no se, se presentó por parte de una organización, sino fueron al menos ocho acciones eh, que al principio no eran coordinadas, pero que eh, posteriormente, cuando ya se eh, empezó a levantar el tema, ya empezaron a surgir alianzas entre las organizaciones, alianzas también con algunos congresistas eh, del Congreso de Guatemala que estaban en contra de esas leyes regresivas, y también alianzas con algunas organizaciones internacionales. Incluso nosotros desde Transparencia Internacional eh, empezamos a trabajar en un amicus curie, y que esto significa amigo de la corte, que es un documento legal en el que eh, se pretende eh, o se da elementos o argumentos a la corte de constitucionalidad para que ellos puedan tener una resolución. Y toda esta estrategia dio como resultado eh, que lográramos que la Corte declarara que se estaban violando los derechos de las aso asociaciones y eh, suspendieron el trámite de la ley. Eh, yo creo que ahí esa, es, 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 esas alianzas, esas estrategias jurídicas, ese trabajo en conjunto, eh, sí dio resultado a nivel mediático, a nivel político y a nivel jurídico, y lo que se logró es que se detuviera esa, esa reforma legal que se pretendía que eh, resulta regresiva pero que aún no ha terminado esa amenaza porque por medio de otro tipo de regulaciones administrativas se ataca a las organizaciones. Yeah. Okay. Uh, excellent. And, um, could you briefly say something about the international engagement in Guatemala, Eddie? Sí, eh, mucha de la estrategia que se trabajó fue también en denunciarlo hacia entidades internacionales. Acá la Corte Interamericana de Derechos Humanos se manifestó y se eh, manifestó la preocupación acerca de las restricciones a la libertad de asociación. También hubo algunos contactos con congresistas, de, incluso del, del gobierno de los Estados Unidos. Eh, también una una relación con varias organizaciones internacionales, incluso, eh, por ejemplo, la Alianza por el Gobierno Abierto se manifestó porque eh, organizaciones acá en Guatemala lo solicitaron y al menos eh, se emitieron comunicados por parte de 70 organizaciones eh, a nivel internacional de todas las partes del mundo, manifestando la preocupación sobre ello. Entonces, fue tanto a nivel político como también a nivel eh, mediático el trabajo que se realizó y pues el apoyo de la comunidad internacional fue determinante. Además de ello, acá hay un grupo de donantes que son las embajadas que trabajan acá en Guatemala que se llama G13, que también pues hay un, hubo un trabajo de cabildeo con ellos para que se manifestaran y eh, pues dijeran que es, eh, esa ley de ONGs afectaba realmente la libertad de asociación. Yeah, okay, great, thank you. I think that's an important to note in the Guatemala case. Now I'd like to turn back to, uh, to Debebe. Um, Debebe in, in Ethiopia, you really um, uh, had to uh, 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 pursue your rights for a, a number of years. Um, there's a smaller group of civil society that was focused on that, which was able to stay afloat and viable uh, through different um, uh, funding procedures. Um, 
uh, that were a little bit creative, but could you tell us a little bit how the civil society coalition operated and how you engaged over the years with government, how it was successful or it wasn't? Much, uh, free. Uh, well, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, the previous legislation that, uh, that was enacted in 2009 had uh, a great impact uh, in terms of uh, affecting uh, the sector, uh, in terms of uh, limiting its capacity, uh, and also even in terms of number, particularly when it comes to CSOs working uh, in areas of uh, human rights, uh, good governance, um, access to justice. So uh, immediately after uh, you know, the enactment of this legislation, the sector uh, is becoming uh, very active uh, in terms of designing different mechanisms, uh, advocacy mechanisms uh, to convince uh, the government. I remember initially uh, there was um, one research uh, which came out uh, uh, maybe in parallel with uh, uh, that legislation. Uh, the main objective of uh, that research was to show the government how you know, the civil society organizations are important, uh, not only um, in the area of economic development, but also uh, in the area of uh, democratizing uh, the country, uh, particularly, you know, by mentioning the role of um, a few CSOs. Uh, by the way, even at that time, uh, as compared to uh, the number of uh, organizations working in areas of service delivery, those working in uh, human um, uh, human rights areas were uh, very, very uh, 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 limited. But in any case, uh, they made contributions uh, in terms of building the capacity of um, uh, law enforcement officials uh, and also even in terms of raising awareness. So that research paper was presented to the government uh, and um, that research paper you know, has all facts and figures, particularly when it comes to um, resource mobilization when it comes to, you know, serving as a good source of um, um, uh, hard currency. But still, uh, the government, uh, because of uh, their political ideology, because of the perception that they have, uh, the government uh, couldn't be um, convinced. Uh, so the, the government finally adopted that draconian legislation. Therefore, again, you know, uh, although not the whole uh, 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 sector as a whole, but a uh, few individuals and also a few organizations, uh, you know, uh, made uh, uh, um, very uh, hard efforts um, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, 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 coming up with different kinds of uh, advocacy approach. Uh, one uh, one approach, uh, I remember, you know, uh, was the GNGO forum uh, that was uh, mainly, you know, uh, serving as its initial purpose was, you know, to uh, to bring the government uh, and also uh, the CSOs so that, you know, uh, they can share um, uh, lessons, experience, and also challenges uh, CSOs are facing so that the government, you know, can be convinced. But later on, you know, this forum um, has been found out that it's rather the government was using it uh, in terms of channeling its own agenda than you know being a two-way approach. So, although we have this GO and GO forum, which uh, usually you now uh, um, uh, conducted annually or on a biannual basis, was at the federal and uh, regional level, but it was not that much successful uh, in terms of influencing the legislation. Um, another approach was uh, uh, it, it, actually uh, this was organized by uh, one of the largest uh, and uh, uh, the oldest um, umbrella organization in Ethiopia that is consortium for um, Christian Development Associations. Uh, annually, this, uh, this uh, consortium has been organizing this National NGO Group Practice Day where uh, you know, uh, uh, selected um, NGOs are coming, uh, coming up with their successful uh, activities uh, in the community, uh, and also, you know, um, uh, bringing um, uh, different uh, uh, stakeholders, including high officials from the government. Uh, at one point, the uh, the president was in attendance, and also even at one point, the prime minister and also uh, minister of health, uh, this kind of high officials. 
Uh, they used to come in the sea, uh, the activities that NGOs uh, I, I know uh, have been doing uh, in the country and also their contribution. This was also one advocacy approach uh, uh, in Ethiopia. Another was, uh, uh, by the way, you know, uh, the contribution of the international community uh, when it comes to uh, influencing this legislation was really very critical uh, and also uh, very uh, uh, impactful. Uh, one approach was uh, when the government uh, uh, denied um, a human rights organization to access Thorium Fund, um, some international organizations like uh, the EU uh, and also uh, the World Bank, they came up with uh, um, innovative approach uh, in terms of convincing the Ethiopian government that uh, their fund cannot be considered as um, a foreign fund, but rather uh, it should be considered as a domestic fund. And its main purpose is to assist human rights organizations uh, so that they can access uh, this fund and really they spend also, you know, a major contributions uh, in terms of ensuring not only the operation of human rights organizations, but also uh, their existence. Otherwise, we may not have even, you know, uh, uh, the current uh, um, uh, human rights organizations, some of them, they might be uh, a periso. This was one innovative approach from the international uh, community. Another uh, support was, you know, uh, again, it was started during the drafting process of the legislation. The international community came up with a dual approach. Uh, one, to support uh, the CSOs uh, in terms of adapting the legislation. And another approach was also to build the capacity of the government uh, to minimize the impact of the legislation. Uh, so they came up with, uh, with this project called Track uh, uh, trend um, uh, in civil society organizations. Uh, its main purpose is to look into the impact of the legislation and to provide um, recommendations to uh, uh, the donor group, uh, Dagis Donor Assistance Group. Uh, another uh, important area, you know, uh, whenever the and government Maybe submit- If you could wrap up in just a minute here. Oh, okay, okay. So these were uh, uh, the different approach. Uh, while we were uh, like this, uh, again, you know, because of political uh, change in the, uh, in the country, uh, again, uh, the CSO sector uh, took the opportunity uh, in terms of uh, uh, submitting its own amendment proposal uh, and also finally uh, in terms of um, coming up with a draft legislation. You know, when the government opened up uh, 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 the space, uh, it was very easy uh, for the sector to come up with different kinds of proposals. So uh, it was easy for us uh, to convince and finally to come up with the current legislation, which by and large uh, up to international standard. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah, th thank you. And, and please find those resources on our website. I'll just say in the chat bar, there are links to each of the country case studies, but now I'd uh, like to turn to Mr. Clement Voulet, the UN Special Rapporteur on the Freedoms of Peaceful Assembly and of Association, um, uh, who's obviously following all of these cases very closely. So um, I'd like to give you a, a chance to speak on the, the global context here and how it relates to these cases. In addition to um, uh, this year, we're celebrating the, the 10th anniversary of, of your mandate. And, and so we're all uh, happy about that. So if you could say a couple of words about that and in your recent reports, that would be um, uh, most appreciated, uh, Mr. Boulet. Uh, thank, thank, thank you very much, uh, Fred, moderator, for giving me the floor. Uh, good morning, member of the panel and those who are watching these events. I would like first to thank the World Movement uh, for Democracy for inviting me to this event to share successful civil society advocacy to protect civic space. Uh, I would like also to congratulate uh, World Movement partners that just spoke now for, their, for, for contributing to produce such interesting uh, uh, testimony, interesting paper, um, on uh, Guatemala, Ethiopia, and also uh, on Nigeria. As you can, you can already uh, know, these three countries are also of big concern to my mandate. And you can see them from a lot of, a lot of uh, 
engagement that we have with county, either through communication or press release. Uh, the law that you mentioned in Guatemala, as you know, was also a big concern to my mandate in Nigeria. Also recently, uh, in relation to the recent event, but also the bill that also you mentioned in Nigeria. Uh, but also um, in Ethiopia, as you know, for a long time, Ethiopia has been uh, one of the main concern for my mandate uh, in regarding to the restriction of civic space, in particular the issue around the, the foreign funding. So these three countries uh, are really, uh, uh, what, are, what, are, what are, are really uh, at the heart of engagement of my mandate in terms of, in terms of the protection of civic space. That's why I'm really happy to see that such documents, uh, such testimony come out on, 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 on compiling this kind of success story is also important to continue to address. So as you know, civic space, uh, including also the right to freedom of association and peaceful assembly, uh, is under restriction uh, globally. Everywhere in the world, we are seeing uh, the erosion of our democratic rights. We are also witnessing uh, the new way that states and non-state actors are developing to restrict uh, our democratic, democratic space. And we know that some of these restrictions, uh, when we talk about that, uh, most of the country feel like some of these restrictions is just to prevent civil society to operate. But we know that some of these restrictions is spread beyond civil society. What those restrictions did is to prevent civil society to be able also to, uh, to offer service, to, to help those who are in need, to help communities, to fight against inequality, to fight against poverty. So it's not just civil society that feel the impact of this restriction, but it's communities. It's those they serve that felt this. This is why it's important uh, for, uh, for state, for, community, for international community to fight against those restrictions. Um, as I mentioned in, uh, in, in my report in, in, to the Human Rights Council in 2018, uh, some of these restrictions are in general uh, driven by armed conflict, security threats, political instabilities, ethnic and religio religious divide, uh, the resurgence of fundamentalist ideology, fragile political and, and government institution, harsh climate condition, because as if, you, if you look around the world, you can also see that this is also, um, climate change is also one of the challenge, one of, one of the reasons, one, one of the cause of some of these restrictions that we are seeing with environment defenders that are facing uh, 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 restriction in over around, the, uh, over around the world. But also, they are also um, caused by also the polarization, political polarization in many countries, you see. So in country where you have, um, uh, there is no political uh, agreement, uh, there is no political consensus among the political actors. Sometimes what happens is that the civil society that defend the, uh, the, 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 the vulnerable group, the communities become the target of governments. So, and one, one thing that I want also to, to, to also mention is that since the creation of this mandate in 2010, the mandate documents all of those restrictions. And uh, among that, I would like to highlight few. The first one, as you mentioned, in the case of Nigeria, Ethiopia, and all, is also the use of legislation to restrict and to suppress any uh, dissident, dissent voice or to suppress the work of this, uh, the civil society. And sometimes this legislation also may also prevent civil society to receive funding, in particular foreign, foreign, foreign funding. And for many years, Ethiopia was in this list of country and we were happy to see that this law was amended recently, uh, but we need to continue to watch the situation, we need to continue to ensure that, as I mentioned at the, at the beginning, we know that in most of the cases, uh, it's political context, it's a context of conflict, that also uh, bring, or that, that also trigger some of these restrictions. So we need to continue to watch those countries and to ensure also that whatever uh, situation that the country may face in future, uh, some of those restrictions that are lifted are maintained. Um, 
We also, we also witness also the increased trend of criminalization and repression of peaceful protest. Uh, as you know, the case of Nigeria recently and uh, Guatemala recently through my tweet, I also raised my concern about repressing the peaceful protest that just claim a peaceful society or just are defending the rights for citizens to be able to exercise their democratic rights. Um, unfortunately, we are also seeing that uh, this repression is increasing in many countries. And I think uh, through, your, through some of the testimony that you bring, it's important also to highlight that uh, civil society can play an important role in preventing or trying to push back some of those restrictions. And I think this is what your, uh, this experience uh, that you are sharing. And we also witnessed the arbitrary arrest detention and deprivation of due process and the right during arrest and detention. Most of the cases when defenders or civil society leaders are arrested during this, uh, the protest, during the protest, we also witness some of them, uh, the, the, the deny of a due process and some of them that are arrested, some of them that are beaten. And for me, for us, it's important, it's important to continue to work on some of those talent to ensure also that uh, even if the if states can accuse some protests to use violence, they have to go through due process. What we are not seeing today, what we are seeing is just that every time you just mentioned also the in Guatemala that in many cases you will see people infiltrate during the protest and commit violence, and some of the time this violence is used as a pretext for the government or for the law enforcement to repress some of these protests. And uh, another aspect also that I want to come is the internet shutdown. Uh, internet shutdown that we witness also in many countries, Ethiopia recently and Nigeria, where we think if, if we look, if we look in 2019, uh, according to some statistics, 1,700, almost 1,700 days of internet shutdown we witnessed during this uh, 2019. So meaning that the states are restoring to the use of internet shutdown just to prevent people to protest, to, to prevent people to communicate, to prevent uh, civil society leaders to mobilize for, uh, for what is the, uh, the exercise of uh, democratic rights, which is peaceful protest. And we, we are also seeing that the COVID-19 exacerbates, and I think uh, uh, um, uh, Ryota mentioned that, magnify, I would say, this, 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 uh, uh, this restriction. We saw, for example, uh, during uh, uh, the beginning of, of this year, the, during the pandemic, uh, the adoption of swiping law, sometimes that it impose, uh, uh, prevents or restricts the gathering and the right to movement. And we also see that some of the states trying to justify the, the hard, the draconian law that they are adopting to increase the power of executive over the legislative by, by using uh, the, the, the health threats, by using the pandemic as a pretext. Um, so I think it's, it's, impo it's, 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 it's important that even if the civic space, the, the restriction of civic space is not now, as you mentioned, I mean, uh, for Ethiopia, you can see how, since how many years that, but we need also to recognize that today, because of the pandemic and because of um, the increase of inequality, the restriction is becoming more. And we have also to, to really pay attention on how COVID-19 is also impacting or is also encouraged such a restriction. And we know also that in many countries, while this situation improved in terms of COVID-19, some of those restrictions are still there. So we need to monitor them and we need also to, uh, to know what is happening, what, what state is, is, is planning in, in order to lift some of this restriction. That cannot be justified. Yes, it cannot be justified uh, on, uh, on, uh, when the situation improves. Um, another aspect that I, I want also to, um, it, it, I want also to, to highlight is that because of some of the challenge that I mentioned to you, some of these threats that we are seeing, uh, I invite you also to go to my 2018 report where I highlight these eight trends. Uh, in my last, in my in in June, in my in uh, in my report that I present to Human Rights Council, 
which mark also the celebration of the 10th anniversary that uh, Ryota was talking, I invite the state to recommit themselves to protect civic space and freedom of association and peaceful assembly. And I think that state cannot do this alone. The state cannot do this alone. And the experience and the work that you are doing, you are sharing today, shows also that civil society have an important and active role to play in combating civic and combating all the restriction and in, com in promoting a peaceful society, but also the democratic space, not just for civil society, but also for communities that need to engage with state, need also space to be able also to be the agent of their own development. But another aspect also I want also to highlight is also that uh, my mandate witness, and this is also one of my, well, the, 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 um, the subject of my recent report to the General Assembly, where I celebrate the many achievements of uh, women-led organization today. We know that from decades, from, from the history, women-led organization uh, fight strongly against authoritarian regime. And they are, those organizations are able to promote democracy. They are able in many countries also, many countries also to be the lead of many revolutions that uh, end to the democratic, to the democracy. And this report also that I present to General Assembly, I invite the General Assembly to continue to, to state, to support those uh, organizations and ensure that those organizations have necessary funding to continue to operate. Because what we are seeing that some of these organizations that are grassroots organizations, when we talk about this, human need organization, don't have access to the funding or because the requirements of the donor are so complicated for them. So it's important for donor community, for state also to continue to support this organization. This organization. I would like to, to end by also commenting the, the important, this important initiative and ensure you that uh, my mandate will continue to monitor the civic space situation in these three countries that you just shared now and amplify your work in defending the democratic space and peaceful society. And uh, rest, uh, ensure also that my mandate will work with you closely. And I think some of this paper that you just published can also be the basis of our collaboration and see how we can continue to support the civil society initiative in these two countries. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, Clement, for um, those wonderful words uh, of encouragement. I wanted to also thank you for mentioning your recent paper on um, women and girls and the right to freedom of peaceful assembly. Unfortunately, on this panel, we lost our female uh, representation, but that is a really important, um, a really important uh, community and set of issues that that we want to to focus on. So. Uh, thank you for your work on that. I also added to the chat bar a link to a video that we created um, uh, highlighting the principles you developed, Clement, on uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and protecting rights during that pandemic. Uh, so if you go to that video, which is in several different languages, you can find a link to those principles um, and access them there. So with that, we're just a few minutes over, but everybody, thank you for an excellent conversation. Uh, Debebe, uh, Eddie, Ibrahim, Ricardo, uh, Clement, Riota, and to our uh, Spanish English interpreters, uh, Kathy and Carmen, uh, thank you very much. Uh, we look forward to celebrating more successes from civil society protecting their rights. Uh, and so if any of the audience uh, have some suggestions for countries that we might focus on uh, to celebrate their successes, uh, send us an email to world at ned.org uh, and, and we'll consider uh, putting together a case study on them. So thank you very much for your uh, participation to the speakers and for your attendance to the audience. Um, and, and I'll wish you a, a good week. Thank you. <laughs>